Il-kol kem aħna xie darba juħra nil taħu ma xie problema. Forsi għal xie huħt problema zajra, għal xie huħt problema ħafnikbar. Il-kol kem aħna naħseb nafrontaw dawn il-problemi b-modi diversi. Dan laħar ġifidejja ktieb, miktub minn ġon xwireb u ma taħx kif tibda taħmel, ma taħ tibda taħra ktieb lewa ħħġa li taħmel naħseb il-kol pħal li taħmlu, tibda u taħra u ftiħt l-introduzzjoni u tibda u taħjti ma dal bniden. Għalix id-deċida li isir bodybuilder għandu musko li ma kulli mkien ħatra għu minna u ftiħti ħor, għalix xie spiraħ biex jamelek. U ma taħ tibda taħra l-istoria tija u jja storja li tqabdek il-bart ma ġismek kollu fl-opinjoni tija u ħat kunu taħfu dwarra fil-fat kien eddin il-part tili, right? Living proof my story. John, I'm just saying that we all have problems, we all have difficult situations, but we all tend to face them in different ways. Your way of dealing with your problems is this, which is not easy. Yeah, it was the start. This is how I sort of started to deal with my problems, was to uh, you know, train and, and exercise and vent my frustration and, and hopefully by building a, a sound and solid physique that I would um, create some sort of defense or a wall uh, from other people coming into my life and uh, creating havoc and abuse, you know. So that's how it started, but it didn't stay that way forever. I know that even though it's difficult for you to talk about your past, you are willing to do it because obviously you feel you can help other people. Yeah, that's fine. Would you like to talk to us about your childhood? Sure. Like, um, I, I will say this, the, the first thing, because you made a good point. I, it's, it's never about trying to make, uh, I, I'm not looking for anybody to feel sorry for me or any empathy at all. I'm, I really am trying to get people to understand that this happens, what I went through happens all over the place. And it's usually the secrets that no one knows about. Yet the children that grow up in this kind of atmosphere are the ones that are hurting the most and they need a, an outlet, they need to be heard and, and hopefully to stop this kind of trouble. But, you know, I mean, I grew up, unfortunately, in a, in a situation where, you know, I had young parents, very young. Um, I was probably considered what you might say a mistake, right? Um, that wasn't planned for, for sure. Um, and uh, because of the, the situation and um, so on and so forth, I was put out for, um, into custody, child care custody, at a very, very young age. Um, you, were only, you were only two or three, right? I was when less. No, less, I was, less yeah, I was less. I wasn't two yet. And um, so I was made um, a part of the Catholic Archdiocese, and I'm from Canada. And um, um, I went through a series of homes because um, of obviously personal problems in the homes. I mean, I was too young to have caused any issues. Um, and people unsure whether they wanted to keep me. There was abuse in those homes. There was problems in those homes. And the problems, you know, was put onto me. And so I traveled a lot. And then I finally um, was uh, made uh, permanent custody in one place for nine years, which was a very um, hellish experience. A lot of physical abuse, a lot of mental abuse, a lot of just... Uh, what age were you then? I was three when I went there. And I was there till I was 12. But a lot of, uh, it was interesting because it's just all the dysfunction that these families were having was being pushed onto me and I was the one who was feeling the brunt of it all. So but My question would, would be, why, why would someone decide to foster someone when mm -hmm. they have all this hatred, this, this, this pain that they want to inflict? I don't know, you know, I mean, I, yeah, just the other day I actually got the files of my youth. I got the files from all the experiences I went through and I was reading it and I mean, they knew right away that they didn't want to keep me and they were unsure of whether they wanted to adopt me or not. And um, so I, don't, I couldn't even answer. I mean, I, I looked through it and I thought, yeah, it didn't really make any sense. It's not like they were a loving family who wanted to have uh, a, an extra child in their house. It was more of a burden. But I also think, too, in those times, in the you know, early 70s, late 60s and such, it was a business. And okay. people were able to bring in a child and get paid to do so. So... Um, uh, you know, I mean, I can't answer for them. I mean, it's, it, it's dysfunction upon dysfunction, and it, it was, like I said, it was put onto me. And um, Let me just go to Maltese for a second, do you mind? Sure, go right ahead. Well, John was one of them who was originally from Canada, who was Canada, in fact, he was born in Malta, but he was born in Malta, and he was born in Canada. U meta kienadu ta eta vera ment tenera għalix il-ġenju surzija u kienu zar ħafna u ta kello lilu ma kienuċ preparati għali ħallura poġġewa għal fostering. Dan ġi fosterijat fi diversi 
familje في واحدة من نوع بارتو كلار مانت اللي فيها دام دي ساسنين جي أبوزات فيزيكال مانت مانتال مانت وفيا مانت المارجنا في ديك لتا بيت ليتا و 12 سنة تتاد من دان لو جيه من دين اتباتية وما تستطع من شاين دوارة When you were 12 what happened? Uh, oh, when I was 12, um, you know, one of my social workers had said to me, um, would you be interested in, in um, if we found your father, would you be interested in meeting him? And because I had experienced such bad situations for the last nine years, um, I was looking to get out. I mean, I was hoping for any kind of intervention to get me out of that house. And so, yeah, I said, yes, of course, for sure. Uh, and uh, so that's what happened. I came to be that I met my, met my father and um, uh, for the first time. Um, and he was still quite young, and um, it wasn't a relationship that uh, went well. It, I was there six months with him, and um, it was more of the continuation of what I had experienced for the... Uh, Once again. Yes. Um, so it, it started the, the door wide open again, and I continued to travel from home to home, to emergency placements, to group homes, to um, until finally... Um, at the latter age of 14 years old, the, the government and my care workers said that it's beyond reproach. Nobody's going to adopt you. Um, and um, it's probably better where, that... Were you fighting it back, John? Were you, were you retaliating in any way? No. Growing up like that, there was... No, I never retaliated. I, I went within myself. I had to find a... <clears throat> I had to find a personal space within myself to survive it because it leaves you feeling, well, I mean, what? Not loved, not wanted, not needed, you're not cared about, you feel alone, ostracized, you, you're you going through so many different emotions because, you know, you're growing up this way, you're a child, and children need love and affection and tenderness and not, not what I was getting. And, you know, and you're left asking yourself questions like, why me? Like, what, you know, what did I do? So, no, I didn't... Um, no, it was, a, it was a bad situation, and I think, you know, suicide was a, it was a common theme in my mind, and many other things, too, you know. I mean, I had said this once before, but, you know, I used to lie in my bed and hope that, you know, um, thieves or robbers or murderers would come into the house and decimate the family and take me with them, because I was so desperate to get out. So, yeah, it, it just created that situation, and um, finally, being on my own, I thought was going to be better for me as well as they thought that, that was the only option that I had left and ultimately it was. How did you find, I mean, okay, a 14 year old living on his own, I even don't think you had much income or if any, they took how, care how of did me. you survive? Okay, they took care of you. Well, yes, because I was, uh, my parents were this, the government, so I was a permanent ward of the court. Uh, and so they allotted me an allowance. I think my first allowance uh, back then was $360 a month to pay for my rent and food. So it was very difficult. I, um, for food, I used to eat macaroni and cheese and cake mix. So I used to take the cake mix powder and mix it together. I used to make soup with the ketchup and water. It was, it was hard times. But um, on one hand, I was free of abuse. You know, I, I was actually free. Uh, but on the other hand, I was very trapped because, you know, as I said, growing up in the way that I did, I've always been that kind of soul that needed to be loved and cared about. I always wanted that, com that affection and, and, and such, and I never got it. So I'm free, but I'm alone. And it's, it's, it struck a nerve inside me, and uh, it put me through a lot of hard, hard times. You know, again, it, it, I was faced again at the end of the, my first year on my own, whether or not I wanted to live or not. And so I, I confronted that in a very serious way. And um, upon taking certain steps uh, and to, um, to really end my life, I came to really start to find my life. And that there was something inside of me deep within that um, I wanted to survive. And there was, I think that at that point I came to realize, as young as I was, that there was something that I was here for. I had a purpose. And these things that happened didn't happen just by chance. They didn't happen just because I was a bad kid, because I, I'm a kid. How could I be bad? Um, but there was a bigger picture. And yeah. as you know from reading the book and yeah. stuff, um, there's a huge picture in, the, in that. Seeing you today, to mm. be honest, I can't imagine you being 14 years old, mm. lonely mm. and weak. Because mm. now if I had to see you in a room, mm -hmm. you scare me. I mean, <laughs> you're big. So w what happened? Where, when did the transformation start? Um, well, the physical, as far as me actually training, it started at 19 years old. Okay. Um, and and it, was it because you were venting out your anger? Was it? No, no, no. no. I was... Um, 
Uh, I was in the gym and I saw a woman that was 150 kilos, very large, uh, in a fitness facility where it was with people that were all in shape. And uh, I saw her, um, uh, you know, trying to get a membership and so on and so forth. And then it just looked like she was very uncomfortable. And I thought to myself, wow, just really impressive that a woman of her stature would come into a place like this because she was instantly judged and criticized for being so large. And uh, as if to say, you know, why would she be in there? And when I, um, when I saw her in there and I saw the feeling uh, th that she experienced, I related to me because um, at that moment, I seen her at home saying to herself, I'm this way, I'm unhappy, I'm not satisfied with anything, I don't want to see myself in the mirror, I don't, I, I don't want to go out, I, I'm going to make one last effort to change my life. And so she might have seen an ad in a paper that said, come to our gym, change your life forever, da da da, da for nine ninety nine. So she showed up and I saw her get abused because I saw her be, being taken advantage of. We just want the money from you and we really don't care how you feel. And when I saw that, I could relate. And I always wanted somebody there for me and there was nobody. Um, so I saw her and I said, I want to be there for her. Um, I want to give her what she needs because I know what she needs because I never got those things myself. And right away I, I, I was able to realize the connection that I had with people. And that's when I started my business. And that was 1986, and that's just over uh, 25 years ago. And, and ever since then, I have been creating connections with people on a very personal level, because I know what it's like not to be loved, I know what it's like not to be respected, I know what it's like to be told you're no good, you're worthless, you'll never make it, why are you doing that? Oh, that's silly, stop, don't do that, you can't accomplish this, you can't do that. I know those things. I know them like the back of my hand. And I know when I can identify that in somebody else. I see it in somebody else because they talk that way, they express that way, they express this belief. Apart that, from being a nutritionist and mm, a trainer, you're mm. also a motivational speaker. Yes. And uh, although today our time has run out, oh, unfortunately, yes. um, I'd like to invite you again to come and talk to me about being a motivational speaker, For about sure. how you can motivate me. Mm to stop eating chocolate in front of TV, <laughs> to do some, something or right. to, I mean, there are a lot of people who always say tomorrow, mm -hmm. yeah, it will mm -hmm. come or not me, I'm not capable, mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know you have the power to help us. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Brilliant, John. Excellent. Would you accept our invitation I would love again? To. Yeah, for sure. Brilliant. All so, right. With John, we're going to be meeting again. Um, John, you have to do a lot of work with your motivation. You speak in the world, and you have to do a lot of work with your motivation. And you have to do a lot of work with your motivation. You have to do a lot of work with your motivation. I know you understand a bit of Maltese. We have to do a lot of different things in our lives. And we have to do a lot of work with John. We have to do a lot of work with John. I thank you, John. Thank you very much. And thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Brilliant. All right. Please reclaim me. Wara Inspire.